Good evening, Toastmasters. Many thanks for coming on this call on this cold and windy winter's evening. At least that's what it is in Nottingham. Um, I'm John Cox and I'm the District 71 Director and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for this evening and facilitating the questions and answers. Our speaker is Toastmaster Kevin Lee. Kevin is well known in the district, having been a member of the district leadership team from 2013 and our district director in 2015, 2016, and the district pathways chief ambassador in 2016. So you now know who to blame. This year he is our district leadership committee chair, and he will be explaining that role later. Kevin joined a pre-charter Toastmasters club in Kuala Lumpur and on arriving in Glasgow to continue his studies in 2001, became a charter member of Glasgow Toastmasters in 2002. Kevin is an army general practitioner and father to three young boys, Ronan, who is four, and Sean and Kian, both two. He enjoys good food, fine wine, single malt whiskey, international travel and scuba diving, but he's a bit soft because he'll only do that in tropical waters. Kevin will be taking us through a number of slides to explain the various leadership roles and the benefits of taking on a leadership role and the route to becoming one of the district leaders. He will be taking questions and we suggest that you have a, if you have a question, you will enter it into the, type it into the box at the bottom of the control panel and I will read them out to Kevin to get an answer. So let me introduce Kevin now. Welcome Kevin and many thanks for running this webinar for us this evening. The floor is yours. Uh, District Director John, uh, Brenda, uh, Public Relations Manager, fellow Toastmasters. I think I'm, I'm going to jump straight in. So John, shall we move the slides along? John's controlling the slide pack because uh, I'm uh, tethering uh, on a mobile phone. So you get my voice, but most of the burden of the, of the graphics are going to come from John's computer in, uh, in Nottingham. Uh, it's equally wet and windy here in Ireland. Uh, we're here for the weekend, um, me, Fiona, and the boys. So I've put up uh, a kind of a short agenda of what, what I'd like to cover with all of you today. It's, it's delightful to see uh, 26 people already logged on. I, I hear that some 70 people are signed up. So it's a lot, uh, a, a lot better uptake compared to when we first rolled out or when Michael Collins first rolled out webinars across the district. I thought we'll talk about some of the benefits of uh, being a district leader, uh, some that are perhaps obvious, others that many of you who are considering becoming a district leader don't think about, or some of the benefits that you may consider actually that's a hassle rather than a true benefit. The, we'll talk about what district officer positions are elected. Some are mandated by Toastmasters International, others are by choice of, uh, by, by choice of our district. The nominations process has, has changed significantly this year. <clears throat> and lastly, and perhaps throughout the, uh, throughout the webinar, if questions pop up, um, I, I, I'll definitely have time at the end to take them, but throughout the webinar, I will try and take some of the questions that are more pertinent. Uh, so feel free to start populating, populating the question section on, um, on your uh, module, on your GoToWebinar module, on, usually on the right-hand side of the screen. Okay, John, let's move on. I think before I start, I thought we'll put up a few of uh, the fundamental uh, guidances that drives all Toastmasters. I've put up the TI mission, but actually the bit that all district leaders contribute towards uh, is the district mission. And the district mission fundamentally has two bits, building new clubs, and supporting all clubs in achieving excellence. Whatever your definition of excellence is, World Headquarters has chosen to, me has chosen to measure that through the Distinguished Club Program and the Distinguished District Program. That is what the Board of Directors feel are the, uh, uh, are the points that reflect what they want to see every club provide every single member. Uh, so let's move on to the next slide. So what are the benefits of being a district officer? I've broadly divided it down into the benefits that you, you would see immediately 
as you uh, as you start your year and um, the benefits that actually you will um, enjoy for the rest of your life, uh, possibly. So, John, let's move on. Uh, there's a question saying they can't hear. Yes, it's uh, from it? Gina Gallison. My, my guess is that the problem would be at her end. OK. Um, I'm gathering everybody else can hear. I can hear you. Um, yeah, it, it may be a problem at her end. OK. Let's move on to the next slide. Brenda's come on and said she can hear OK. OK, great stuff. So let's look at some of the in-year benefits. It looks like quite a long list, so let's get the obvious ones out the way. Uh, service as a district officer uh, is a requirement towards the Distinguished Toastmaster Award. So under the classic education program, it is part of the Advanced Communicator Silver. And under Pathways, it is an additional requirement to the two paths that you have completed level five for in order to get your Distinguished Toastmaster Award. Many of you will know that there is currently there is currently an additional provision uh, in order to allow people to to, to gain uh, the, uh, the the leadership credit. Uh, successful club coaches um, that uh, successfully turn around their club before the end of this Toastmaster year, the 30th of June 2020, that service will count in lieu of being uh, being a district officer, as well as counting. Um, towards the club building requirement for the ACS uh, under the old system. So um, this year is a great year to be a club coach. Um, the club, uh, the pathways, guys and ambassadors had a lot of difficulties um, getting their service recognized. Uh, and I expect that the same thing will happen to those of you who are successful club coaches this year. If you want to claim double credit for being a club coach, uh, you are more than likely Going, going to have to submit a paper application for your ACS if you want the old classic education uh, reward for an ACS. So just bear that in mind. Uh, I suspect not many VPEs who are in service today uh, have actually submitted a paper application uh, for an ed education award. Uh, I'm sure John has. He's been in the system long enough. Uh, I certainly have when I was VPE. Uh, so that's the that's the educational credit. It's supposedly a very obvious one. People forget about it. Um, the second bit is is um, financial support. Now, most of you will know that 25% um, of membership payments comes to the district. So that's 1125 out of the 45 US dollars that people pay every six months comes to the district. And that's for every member payment. So you're looking at 2250 um, US dollars. Uh, for a member that renews twice within the Toastmaster year. Uh, some of that money is being put towards supporting uh, area governors, uh, area directors, division directors, and the DLT in carry, carrying out their duties. Uh, and one of that is uh, helping financially support you to attend uh, the district conference. Uh, it comes in, historically, it's come in two forms as a reduction in the conference fee and also a contribution to the cost to travel to Kilani. Uh, of course, as part of the district executive committee, you will be contributing to setting uh, how much each area and division director will get in that year together with uh, the DLT. So that financial support may mean that where you never had an opportunity to go and see a district conference, this year it might become viable. Uh, for those that subsequently go on to become the district trio, the district director, uh, program quality director and club growth director. Toastmasters International allows the district to support uh, the top three officers to attend the international convention. And most of you would know that the next international convention in August 2020 is happening in Paris. It will be the closest international convention um, to, to uh, UK members and Ireland members. It is the second international convention that's ever been held outside North America. The first one was 2013 in Kuala Lumpur. So there is no better time than 
to, to, to think about going to uh, an international convention. The other benefits, I, from my personal experience, I was an area director in, uh, in 2012-2013, area governor at the time. <clears throat> uh, and one of the things that came with the job description was to visit, to do club visit reports. So effectively to evaluate another club. And we are an organization that sees evaluation as the foundation of everything we do. So now it's not just evaluating a speaker, a role player, but actually evaluating how the club makes a visitor feel, how the club meeting vibe is. So area directors are at the forefront of doing that. But of course, as uh, division directors or members of the district leadership team, uh, when uh, a district officer comes to visit your club, they are constantly uh, making evaluations of the club and actually learning things from a club to take away to potentially use in their own club. Uh, many, many of our members join because they want to have speaking opportunities. When you step outside the club, so those of you who have been club presidents, you get a speaking opportunity virtually every single club meeting. It becomes a chore after a while. Uh, become area director you will get even more speaking opportunities to larger audiences. If you imagine that your club meeting has 12 people turning up, an area event may well have 50 people turning up, uh, a division event, uh, 50 to 100 people turning up, and a district, when a district director stands up to address, um, address the conference, uh, you may have uh, two or 300 people sitting in the room for a speech contest. Uh, one of the most rewarding things personally for me as, as a district leader was the opportunity to recognize members. So on the day that you turn up to the club, they go, oh yeah, the area director's here. Um, one member has delivered uh, a final speech to get um, get an award today. So would you be would you be the person that, you know, leads the standing ovation? Would you, uh, uh, would you be willing to hand out a little memento from the club to this particular individual? And I really, I really enjoy doing that bit, bringing a certificate to congratulate a club for being select distinguished, for to congratulate somebody for recruiting members, for sponsoring members, for hitting the Smedley Award. Uh, and did you know that uh, you can buy a ribbon for your club if you were the area director or division director uh, and uh, let your club hang on their banner? And John's club this year, I'm sure John was uh, struggling to work out which club to give the give the ribbon to home club of the district director a unique opportunity to to recognize your club being a member uh, of district three administration clubs got, very interesting a very interesting three piece. clubs i bought three oh you're, you're john bought it for all three there you go uh, district administration so the club base uh, the district base at the end of the last toastmaster year uh, 30th of June 2019 was over 10,000 members, 10,715. You can see that on the Toastmaster International website, it's open information. Let's imagine that there were 10,000 member payments um, across the year, each amounting to 45 US dollars. So that gives the district a running budget of $112,500 US dollars. The district runs in euros, so it'll probably come up to about 115,000 euros. Or 110,000 euros, actually, the euro is slightly stronger. <clears throat> you then run two conferences uh, in, in the old days. These days, you run one conference. The conference budget will run between 40 and 50,000. So, how many of you in your kind of day job comfortably manages a sum of money like that uh, that affects 200 outlets? Uh, area directors, between three and seven clubs, division directors up to 30 clubs. It's an opportunity to look after and see growth in um, these number of clubs. So I think that's a privileged position. And that's part of district administration uh, as a member of the district executive committee. And lastly, another bit that nobody tells you about, when you're the area director, suddenly the local Rotary Club invites you to turn up and speak. Speechcraft is ran in your local area. They go need to find somebody to hand out the prizes. The area directors, easy call. Or if the division director lives in the area, an easy person to invite out. The local school has youth leadership. 
you're asked to hand out the prizes. Great privilege to see success in the smiles of people's faces. So that's just in the year of taking on district role. So if we move on to the next slide, we'll look at some of the longer term benefits. This is what I am enjoying and I continue to enjoy today from being a district leader. From visiting numerous clubs, I've seen things that I've brought to, uh, brought to my own home club. I then, I move quite, quite frequently, every two or three years I move locations. I then have a different home club. I bring some of those ideas to the new home club. And that all serves to increase variety, uh, improve standards, and just make your club a little bit different to everything that's around it. Of course, after doing one district leadership role, you may find it draws you in and you want some more. You've enjoyed it so much, you will then go from area director to division director and beyond. And of course, after the district, there's region advisor and, and actually international director. You know, for every decision to in introduce a new education program, to increase dues, to decide what rules get passed in uh, for 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 speech contests, there is a person at the back voting for that. Uh, so international directors carry that. District leadership teams are advised by a regional advisor, usually somebody who's been a successful district director in the past, takes on the role of regional advisor uh, as a mentor to the district leadership team to help them get more success out of their district. Um, I have put up some of the skills that I learned and, and picked up in my time as uh, as a district officer. Um, and I kind of the, the list is a lot longer than that. The list is the, the list includes things like budgeting uh, to, to maintain Toastmasters International's charitable status. Now, most of you, most of you kind of go, oh, well, it's a charity, it's a charity. Of course, it's a charity. The accounting standards have to meet uh, the charitable accounting standards in a first world country like America. Um, you may wonder what the consequence is if TI loses his charitable status. Um, Ralph Smedley um, was intestate when he died and um, <clears throat> Toastmasters International was allowed to use the copyright of his material as long as it remained a non-profit organization. If it were to become a profit organization, then his legitimate heirs, currently the government of California, because he's intestate, um, will then own the copyright to some of the fundamental education material that forms the foundation of the classic education program and pathways. So that's a scary thought. So how the district officers run a budget, and there are 126 districts, Clearly not every number is alive, some districts have closed, uh, but the largest numbered district is District 126. Uh, all have to run a budget that conforms to First World Standards accounting. And so have a think about that. Um, part of being a district leader and, and how that is different from being uh, a manager of five subway branches, five super drug uh, branches, five super Mac branches, um, is that the usual managerial levers that are available to managers in the workplace are not broadly available to you as a district leader. So you have to focus on um, using interpersonal relationships, negotiate, persuade, inspire, resolve conflict, buy coffee for people. Uh, so the, uh, the financial rewards that are normally available to a manager is not available here. The career progression rewards normally available to managers are not available here. But actually, you can see that as an opportunity to sharpen um, the interpersonal skills that Toastmasters is about. And lastly, I put friendship down and I put or more because I married uh, someone who served with me on uh, the district leadership team. Now, you might say that that's unique uh, across the world. That is not completely unique, has happened before. Uh, but in my case, I got more than friendship out of serving um, on the district. So let's move on to the next slide. 
So, what district officer roles are available out there? Uh, let's move on. Now, I purposely put up this, this little fireplace because it's freezing, it's cold. Some of you have got a fireplace at home <clears throat> and it's lit and you're listening to me blethering away and the fire's burning behind you and it's very comfortable. But actually, how many of you have thought about, well, how do we get to the log fire? Somebody had to cut the wood, somebody had to buy the kindling, somebody uh, had to light the fire and actually to keep it going. Um, <clears throat> to keep it going requires somebody to stoke the fire, add a bit more firewood. It's, it, it's a bit of effort. And if you're the only person doing it for another 19 people to enjoy it, you get tired very quickly. Uh, so Toastmasters is a bit like that. It's a fireplace, but to keep it going, everybody chips in. And frankly, the good Toastmasters clubs, the ones that are not just presidents distinguished, but better, um, you might get a glass of wine when you turn up. Um, when I was uh, an area director, I managed, to, uh, I managed to persuade the hosting club to provide that. As uh, as part of their uh, as part of their division contest, we hosted division contest, and the division director at the time uh, neither did he, did he have to pay for coming in. He got a glass of wine. His jaw nearly fell to the ground. <clears throat> but um, if you think about all the roles that require that have to be done, um, who's sourcing the firewood? And when you're in the club, you don't think about that. But as a district officer, you are part of the supply chain. Of the firewood that keeps keeps that fire going, that keeps people drawn in. And Toastmasters is not just about enjoying the fireplace. You don't just get warm by it. You actually grow stronger by enjoying the fireplace. So that's a unique thought. Uh, and to be part of that process is a huge privilege. So let's look at let's go to the next slide and look at some of the elected um, district positions. Just before you go on to that, Kevin, we've got a I don't know whether it's a question or whether it's just a comment, but Marjorie Lonergan has put effort and energy. Now, I don't know whether she's asking how much effort and how much energy has to go into those roles. Yes, very interesting. Um, there's also a question saying, why can't, it, why can't you see my face? Um, so I'm the <laughs> voice. John is the slide controller. Um, and I don't know historically. Historically, when I, when I did webinars um, as part of the DLT, um, the speaker's face was not put up. I have no objection to putting my face on, uh, assuming that uh, uh, assuming that the uh, the bandwidth will take it. So, uh, uh, should I try and do that, John? I'll switch on the camera so people can see my face. Okay. Uh, how much effort? Very good question. Um, you can dedicate a few hours, or you can dedicate your whole life to doing the job. Um, and it's about choosing what you want to manage, recognizing what objectives you have to achieve. Um, it's a bit like saying, so when I, when I joined my first pre-charter club, uh, I, I got asked, you know, uh, would you like to be the vice president of education? I say, what's involved? Oh yeah, getting agenda done. I say, yeah, of course. Uh, most of you who have been VPEs is a bit more than that. Those of you who, are, who volunteered to be club president, you got told, oh, yeah, um, the club uh, business session and uh, a committee meeting every six weeks. You might have got that description. The reality can be vastly different. It could be a lot more or it could have been a lot less. And the same works with uh, district positions. So as an example, Luan uh, will, will typically say that she, spent, she, she gets something like 70 emails. Um, on a daily basis, so we had a, quite a turbulent year as 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 a district at the time. Um, I was probably getting uh, less than half half of that. I was getting about thirty. Uh, Michael, my successor, uh, chose to manage um, manage direct contact with members by restricting the hours of contact. But he had um, a set two hour period every day that he will respond to WhatsApp messages, Toastmasters emails coming directly from members. So there are ways for you to manage that workload. The work behind the scenes is what you choose to do and what you choose to delegate. 
So I'm going to uh, move on now. Uh, shall we look at the next slide, John? So here's a list of uh, elected district officers. Uh, it's divided into all districts and some districts. The one that says all districts is mandated by Toastmasters International. That means that every district in the world, uh, all 126 districts, are required to elect the position of district director, program quality director, club growth director, and all division directors. Now, you may be surprised there are a number of districts across the world where there is only one division in the whole district. Uh, some are because they are new. Uh, others are because that district is about to fold. The, you know, the smallest district in the world uh, has around 60 clubs. We are a district of over 200 clubs. So there's a vast difference. And, and the very large districts around the world are, are, are edging 300 clubs. Uh, so for the four positions at the top, all of those must be elected and they must be elected every year. In the second part, some districts can choose to elect their public relations manager, administration manager, finance manager, and area directors. Uh, John, if you click next, two of the jobs will disappear. So in our district, we have chosen, the district council has chosen uh, in the past, and that has been kept on to elect the public relations manager. Our district has also, uh, since 2013, chosen to elect area directors, but that is not a function carried out by the district council. So the area directors are elected by the area council. So we won't be discussing um, uh, area director elections uh, on this webinar. So let's, uh, so the area director will, will disappear next when John clicks the mouse again. Uh, so really when we talk about elected district officers, um, we are talking about the mandatory ones plus the public relations manager's job. So let's move on to the next slide. So if I've sold it to you and you think, do you know what? It's a great opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to, to join the deck uh, if you're a club officer or if you're already area director, you're thinking, hmm, maybe I want to try and be a division director, uh, work with four area directors and up to 30 clubs. Great idea. Get to see a larger part of the country. So how do I get elected? So this bit here has changed. So some of you have been around for a while and you, you've got comfortable with the process. There have been a number of changes introduced to Protocol 9.0 this year. And John sent that out on the 27th of November uh, as a kind of calling notice for nominations. So I'm going to talk through that process uh, as, as in how it's going to apply for this, this election round. And of course, the board of directors can add processes uh, every single year. So let's go to the next slide. I think the first thing to put up is what the timetable looks like. So on the 27th of November, um, all of you would have received the email from John, and that is a call for candidate declarations. So that's really an invitation for people to put their hand up to say um, they want to run for a district office. Uh, you will notice that in that email, it says that um, you, you, you can declare from the 15th of January. The wording in Toastmasters International says, uh, declarations, so call, calling for nominations should begin no later than the 15th of January. Um, ours has began on the 27th of November, so we're ahead of the crowd. At the very end, it also says that nominations close on the 15th of January. That's a typing mistake. It should say the 15th of March. Uh, so I don't know what is worthwhile, um, John and Brenda, to send an update. The closure of nominations, so the deadline to put your hand up and say you want to run, um, is actually the 15th of March. So I think the same day has been copied twice. So once nominations close, the district leadership committee, um, chaired by myself with a representative from uh, across the, the divisions, will then evaluate every single candidate. Uh, we'll talk about the evaluation process uh, in, in slides below. Uh, we have an initial window of the 16th of March to the 10th of April to uh, evaluate every candidate. And the evaluation process involves an interview 
with two members of the district leadership committee. It doesn't have to be face to face. Uh, recently is, is generally been done by Skype uh, or a similar uh, webinar software that's agreeable between the two. Prior to that, it's been done by telephone if it's unable to be done face to face. But most importantly, <clears throat> by the 25th of April 20, uh, the district leadership committee will publish uh, its report and the nominated candidates will be announced. So candidates that have put themselves forward but are not nominated for whatever reason may opt to run as floor candidates, uh, but those that are nominated uh, will be announced as nominated candidates. And I, I've got a slide later on that shows the difference between um, a floor candidate and a nominated candidate. Okay, So anyone who announces their intent to, to run for district office um, becomes a candidate uh, after the evaluation process uh, all the candidates who have announced their intention to run are then divided into nominator candidates and uh, floor candidates. Uh, the next piece that's, that you can see in italics that's also bold is very important um, and I've deliberately put, um, put uh, quotation marks over the word floor because they're not truly floor candidates anymore. Protocol 9.0 now says that um, floor candidates have a deadline to declare their intent to run and that deadline is a week before the district elections. So because our district elections uh, is planned for Saturday the 23rd of May, uh, the deadline for floor candidates to declare is therefore the 16th of May. So after the 16th of May, Technically, you cannot declare an intent to run. I'll let that sink in for a little bit. So there is no opportunity for the mandated district positions, so division director, club growth, program quality, and district director. For those four positions, there should be no, the, the, uh, the, pro, the process says that there is no opportunity for a floor candidate to suddenly put their hand up at the district council meeting. There are a few caveats to that. For example, if there are no nominator candidates, then um, then this requirement is uh, disposed of. Okay, so there are minimum nomination numbers. Uh, and another seismic change this year is that the committee has to source, so the district leadership committee has to source and nominate two candidates for club growth director. So that's a significant change. And if we haven't, then uh, for that position, floor candidates could actually stand up on the floor, uh, from the floor on the day of the election. Uh, but the safest thing to assume, if uh, any of you wants to join the district, is that you have to have declared your floor candidacy by the 16th of May. And let's move on to the next slide. Okay, this slide shows the uh, nominations process in as graphical a form as I can uh, I can get. Um, firstly, you announce your candidacy. So anytime from receiving John's email, you're allowed to announce that you wish to run. No one's going to hold you to that. It's not a wedding contract. It's not a house purchase. You can announce and change your mind. There's, there is no pressure, okay? It's worth recognizing that uh, for those who make up their mind earlier, uh, announcing your candidacy has benefits because uh, an announced candidate um, has the ability to communicate to the electorate earlier on. So the first campaign com communication um, can run any time from the 1st of January to the 15th of March. So once you have announced your candidacy, the district director will release um, <clears throat> will release the contact details of the district council. So that's uh, the club presidents and club uh, VPEs, as well as members of the deck will be released to an announced candidate. So there is a certain benefit of, um, you know, making up your mind early and deciding that you want to run in that you get to make a communication to an electorate. And that could be an email. <clears throat> uh, it could be uh, if you were hardworking enough, individual phone calls uh, to 
the potential electorate. Historically, it's generally been an email with a link to a website specifically related to the position that you will be campaigning for. Uh, there is a second campaign communication window, and that's um, that's from after the DLC report is published. So anytime after the 25th of April uh, until the uh, until election day, um, and all floor candidates and nominated candidates can make the second communication. Of course, by making up your mind early, um, the early bird gets the worm to a certain extent. Um, by announcing your candidacy, we expect a follow-up in writing. The follow-up in writing comes in three forms. Uh, the links are, uh, are in John's email, and they are also here um, in the box underneath the announced candidacy uh, section. So the first one is a nomination form where you fill in your personal details. Uh, the second one is the officer agreement form. This is the form where, should you be elected, it has to be forwarded to World headquarters. So rather than scramble around for the form as part of the nominations process, TI now demands that that is submitted. Uh, and lastly, there is an application form um, for you as a candidate to list your achievements. Uh, I prefer to receive uh, all three forms by email, and my email address is there. Uh, the slide pack will be shared with the district. Uh, John has uh, has um, put my email in the um, in the call to nominations as well. Uh, if for whatever reason you don't know who to send it to, TI regulations does allow uh, forms to be sent to the district director. Uh, but feel, I, I feel sorry for John having sat in that chair before. It's it's a busy enough job. So rather than get him to help you help help you forward emails. Uh, please do send them directly to the DLC chair. So that's the first bit where you just put up your hand saying, I want to do it. Okay. Then between the 16th of March and the 10th of April, uh, for every job that you've chosen to apply for uh, or, or chosen to announce a candidacy, candidacy for, uh, the regulation says that you can say, I want to become club growth director. And if unsuccessful, I also want to be considered for the position of division Z director. So regulations allow that, and in the past, a number of members have taken that approach. Uh, the complication this year is that for every position applied for, uh, you get two interviews. So if you said you wanted to do program quality, and then you wanted to do club growth, and then you also wanted to be division director, you're getting six interviews. So that is a seismic change compared to the past. So previously, you just got interviewed for district officers. Uh, now it's two interviews per job. So TI has made that very clear. Uh, it's it's going to increase the DLC, DLC workload. Uh, each DLC member that interviews a candidate then fills out an evaluation form. Uh, and at the end, um, <clears throat> all DLC members look at the evaluation forms and vote on whether to nominate the candidate or not. Um, you see my face as DLC chair. You'll be pleased to know I'm the only person without a vote on the district leadership committee so you can't even bribe me i do enjoy single malt whiskey and tropical warm waters but you can't bribe me so hey ho <clears throat> um, in order to be successful you have to receive a majority of uh, the dlc vote so once uh, the dlc is voted uh, nominated candidates are notified uh, usually prior to the dlc report being public published on the 25th of april and uh, when you're notified, you also get asked again, what do you still want to serve? Uh, it's, it's amazing how many people who went through the process uh, suddenly has had a, uh, a significant change in life circumstances. Uh, and when they're notified of their success, um, are no longer able to serve the following year. So that's how the nominations process work. And some of you are thinking in your head, actually, it's quite a bit of effort getting nominated. So why don't I just stand as a floor candidate? So we're going to move to the next slide, and this is going to surprise you. So what's the difference between, uh, between being a nominator candidate and being a floor candidate? Uh, actually, the difference has closed significantly. So previously, one of the benefits of being a floor candidate, of deciding on the Thursday night at the Anglo-Irish meeting, actually, do you know what? I think I can be division director. I'm going to go for it. TI has decided to close that loop down. Uh, in order to now be a floor candidate, um, you still have to go through the two interviews 
by the DLC. Okay, so it covers off those who are unsuccessful for the nominations process, and it also then sweeps up uh, people who declare their intentions a bit later, uh, or when the nominations close, if some divisions have no uh, no candidates uh, or one candidate, uh, we may go around and source, but also then put uh, floor candidates through the evaluation process. So the requirement now is that floor candidates for division director, club growth, program quality, and district director uh, must all go through the DLC evaluation process, even if they're floor candidates. The PRM is one unique one where even if they do not go through the DLC evaluation, um, they can stand from the floor. So the PRM is the only job that somebody can stand up from the floor and say they want to stand for it. They only have to meet the eligibility and qualification that has always been present. Uh, so they fill a form to do that. Their record is checked with war headquarters. So is there a benefit of being a nominated candidate? I think there is, okay, because a nominated candidate has received at least a majority of DLC votes. They have declared their intention early, so it's likely to be a considered uh, applicant rather than a last-minute applicant. Uh, the district websites and all club websites are allowed to publish a list of nominated candidates. So that's a, a additional benefit uh, compared to a floor candidate. Uh, of course, some people become floor candidates for very legitimate reasons. Uh, and I think if you were to go down the route of being a floor candidate and you had a legitimate reason, the most common one being contest participation, then uh, you may want to make that clear to the electorate in your second communication. Uh, otherwise, it can be considered scruffy, uh, last minute, and therefore viewed adversely by the voting public. Bearing in mind that every single voter, so every district council member, votes for all the elected officers. So I am from uh, I am from uh, Division E, and I will vote for Division G director. I will vote for the Division N director. I will vote for the um, club growth director. So I vote for every position if I happen to hold a proxy. So I'm not a club officer at the moment, but if I did hold a proxy, I'll be exercising that for every single position that's open for voting. Um, so understand that it's not just the people from your division that are voting for you if you're going for division director. It's the whole, uh, the whole district council. Uh, and for those that don't know you, they might view um, a floor candidate adversely when compared to a nominated uh, candidate. Uh, should we go to the next slide, John? Thanks. Um, I have a question, Kevin, from Claire Claxton. Uh, what, yep. are the, what are the duties for each role? Okay, the duties of each role, if I covered this, will be here to 10 o'clock. Um, <laughs> the duties of each role is included in um, the call to uh, the, the call for nominations. So let's go briefly through them. Uh, we'll start at division director. So most people can see past club. They go, yep, the area director is the person who comes around, writes our club report, uh, <clears throat> and um, runs our club contest. What happens at division director? Division director um, is somebody who's experienced and has been given a, um, a certain output target by the district um, to try and encourage, mentor the area directors um, <clears throat> to get the best out of each individual club. Division director has a broader kind of overview of uh, not just five clubs, but up to 30 clubs. Uh, they are they usually across between three and seven areas and can have quite a large geographical um, geographical base. Uh, you may have heard rumors in the past that division directors only have to run two contests and that's it. But actually, you can do a lot more. Um, the successful division councils um, would run centralized club officer training. So division director knows the level of training provided to every single club officer. Now that's great if your geographical area is uh, Dublin, if your geographical area is um, if your geographical area is the whole of Scotland, um, then it is a significant challenge. But of course, the whole of Scotland has ran a division-wide um, club officer training day before. Uh, yeah, it, it, has, it has historically been very, very successful. Um, so if you look at 
just what the job description says, I think perhaps you're missing out uh, on what else could be done to enrich the experience for members. So we move out to public relations manager. Uh, public relations uh, involves making the name of Toastmasters International known. Uh, it's brand penetration <clears throat> um, with very, very restricted resources. Um, so some of the incentives, some of the initiatives developed by previous public relations managers, um, Hillary Briggs from 2012 um, decided to invest a chunk of um, a chunk of cash on an annual basis with a PR agency. And actually that has proved very, very successful um, for both the UK and Ireland. It's a cost that's shared between two districts. Um, and articles written by Toastmasters from across two districts makes its way into uh, mainstream press um, in, uh, in, in the business world, in manufacturing, in professional organizations, uh, through PR contacts. So it gives our membership uh, our members an opportunity to write something that could be publicized um, beyond uh, what their normal written audience would be. So those initiatives happen. Um, the, the public relations manager may decide to fund uh, and be present in, um, uh, in major fairs to, uh, to, to, to grow clubs in a given locality. Uh, so public relations is doing what it says on the tin, but with a significantly lower budget than you would expect uh, to be able to afford things like ra uh, radio advertising, for example. However, securing new slots uh, on the radio could well be free uh, and may well get you interviewed. And Ted Malamfi is always looking for a public relations manager who's willing to appear on Toastmasters Radio. So there you go. Uh, moving up, the club growth director, um, main responsibility, in fact, the club growth director uh, contributes two of the key district outputs. Um, membership payments and um, the net growth in club numbers. So net growth, in order to have net growth, uh, clubs must be healthy and sustainable. Uh, and that's the overall how output, how the, how the club growth director delivers that on a year-to-year -year basis does vary. Um, <clears throat> there are districts out there that will grow by 50 clubs a year, but actually lose 35 clubs. Okay, We are not one of those districts. We will lose um, two handfuls of clubs maybe uh, in a given Toastmasters year uh, and we'll probably charter something like 20, 20 or 25 clubs. Um, so in order to have a net gain, it, it's about sustaining clubs and Toastmasters International is getting more and more serious about sustaining existing clubs. Uh, the initiative uh, over the last year and a half for club coaches uh, to gain dual credit partially addresses the bottleneck of the classic education system but also then um, shows how serious they are about um, sustaining struggling clubs. A program quality uh, director uh, broadly has two STEM outputs. One is to get clubs to become distinguished clubs, uh, so produce the educational awards that make a club distinguished. Uh, and the second bit is um, to um, ensure that the conference is successful. Um, historically, our district has always delegated that responsibility to a conference committee with a separate conference chair. Uh, TI is um, getting stricter and stricter about requiring the program quality director to be a bank account signatory on conference accounts. Uh, and with now only one conference to run, uh, the job is supposedly easier, but of course there's now 12 uh, divisions and therefore um, for contests with semi-finals at a district conference. So there is a complexity uh, that's added into the single conference, but there's only one conference uh, to run. So those are the two key outputs for the, for the program quality director. And lastly, the district director, uh, the easiest way to describe it is, is being the CEO. So um, to uh, oversee all the strands, um, to be the ambassador, uh, both internally to uh, visit clubs, visit events, um, and to um, to be the outward face for uh, Toastmasters within our district boundaries, so most of the UK and the whole of Ireland, um, and to uh, to hold the responsibility for the budget. Uh, the, the the finance manager may administer it on a daily basis, but this director holds the ultimate responsibility and divides the budget up to the club growth director. Uh, 
to club growing purposes, to educational purposes, conference, speech contests, um, and um, and to uh, to public relations. Um, area and division directors are usually given a small pot of money to spend, um, but with very very kind of um, with very kind of uh, tight guidance of what they can spend it on is usually uh, spent on educational material um, or um, public relations and club growth. So I think that's in a nutshell what the job entails. Uh, there is a list of qualifications. So you have to have, for example, um, to be district director, um, you have to have served uh, 12 months as a club president, and you also have to have done at least an area governor's job for example, area director's job. So there, there are qualification requirements. Uh, the link is there under eligibility and qualifications. Uh, so let's move on to the next slide because I've got 10 minutes left and I've got the last bit to go through and then uh, you can throw all questions you like at me. Uh, so voting day comes along um, and it's easy for me just to say, you turn up the district council meeting, um, there are a number of votes. Um, if you have the most votes, you win. So that's the easy bit. The more challenging bit is that there's something called a candidate showcase. If there was competition, there is a candidate's corner, a district conference that you can put up uh, something about yourself, something about your intentions. <clears throat> um, at the candidate showcase, you get interviewed, you get to make a statement to um, to the uh, to to your voters, and on the day of the election, uh, your two-minute speech could well sway people in either direction. Uh, so I put up the kind of what happens but i think that doesn't paint the true picture uh of what a candidate goes through um during um during district conference so it can be a very interesting district conference in kilani uh, if you were uh, going for a contested role uh, next slide please and i think that we are approaching our proper question session so We've got about eight minutes left, and what's our question bank looking like? We are short of questions at the moment, Kevin. Just, just let Sorry? me throw one in to get them started. Is that people are always concerned about the amount of time that some of these roles will take up, and I think you've explained that to a certain extent. Uh, the person that's in that role is in control of that. They can expand, mm. expand it or reduce it according to what time they have available. Can you add a bit more to that? Uh, I think I'll add one or two points. So um, I think what when, when I did it, it was the year Ronan was born. Um, don't don't have a child in the year you become district director. Absolutely the wrong thing to do. Uh, John was a uh, finance manager uh, with me um, and in his in his year as finance manager uh, everything was done receipts were received on paper um you know accounts were paid um by backs or by check and each check has to be signed by the finance manager and district director uh, that is improving progressively so i think the next year's finance manager will have an online software access to online software licensed by toastmasters international to run accounts so TI is taking measures to reduce the burden on district officers. Um, let's look at um, let's look at uh, club growth, where the key focus is um, encouraging clubs to um, to charter new clubs and to gain more members. Uh, some of that is an education piece. Um, in my year as Lieutenant Governor of Marketing, as the role was known at that time, we had a, a kind of a, a club growth working group. Uh, focusing on increasing the number of members and also um, increasing the number of uh, clubs. Um, TI measures it through member payments. So there is a bit of fudging um, in the system. So if a member joins on the 31st of July, on the 31st of August, okay, and then renews twice, that member effectively appears as three payments in that particular year. Now, if your district has a very small membership, so the smallest district has um, something like 900 member payments a year, okay? It takes 20 members to join three clubs. Now, at, at the peak uh, of, of my Toastmastering time, I was a member of five clubs at one point. Um, and if I then renewed twice in those, um, I 
I individually have generated 10 membership payments that year for TI. So there are ways to skew the books. It is not the intent, but it, it does happen across districts that people do that. So membership payments is measured. But of course, our, our clubs in the UK historically encourage people to join the month after they come and visit the club. So somebody comes to visit you in December, you sign them up to join in January. Absolutely the worst thing that, can, that, that you can do to the district. Um, and some of the measures that you put in as club board director will be to change that behavior. So you will put um, quite a lot of reward for members who join before um, the 1st of October and before the 1st of April. Um, to incentivize people from not putting back um, new member applications. So that's just an example of some of the work that a club board director will get involved with. Um, I mean, how, how much time do you devote to um, de de uh, devote to being district director now, John? Has the job changed? To a certain extent, I'm in control of how much time I put into that, as, as I mentioned with the previous ones. Um, I'm fortunate that I'm semi-retired, so I, I do have some spare time on my hands and I can expand or, or reduce the amount of work I do. But the good thing about district director, of course, is that you have a team of people. So an awful lot of the work of the district director is to support that team and encourage that team to do the various roles. And I think you know what I've learned from the various other roles and when I look at other people doing it is that they've they've been able to work around their time availability if they've got a very busy work life and a very busy family schedule they've been able to work around that if they've got some freedom to put some of their um, some more time into the role they've been able to do that as well so I think you can flex the amount of work that you do according to what time availability you have. Uh, and, and for those of you who are thinking about the, being division directors or area directors, anything contest, oh my God. Um, if the key co contest roles like contest chair, uh, your chief judge are appointed, they are experienced, they are properly trained, um, you know, they are in touch with the district chief judge, most of the headaches go away. Um, you can just turn up and ensure that the trophies are present and hand them out. So it can be a very, very pleasurable day in contest um, for being area director and division director. So you might be hugely worried about it. Um, in my year as um, LGET, I started moving away from the district leadership team, um, being chief judge or being contest chairs at uh, contest. Because um, that year in, um, in Colchester, um, the, the Boudicca conference, we ran out of district leaders to do the job. And that was despite at that in, in that year, that was the year we were about to split. So we had two, um, two club growth directors and two, two program quality directors. Um, but to be able to, to chief judge all of these jobs, you were, you were doubling on each other. Um, and district leaders now, I think, uh, get, to, uh, get to be present at uh, workshops rather than just sit at the back and administer the conference. So things have changed um in in that respect um got a couple of questions very, Kevin. sorry i've got a couple of questions come in yep go for it um first of all from james herford uh do you normally get enough candidates for division director positions uh for some divisions yes um i remember the year i took over the most competitive division had three candidates uh, and a number of divisions had two. There were also uh, divisions where there were no candidates. So it, it, it varies. Yeah, I think that we've had the same experience this year as well. And another mm -hmm. question from Shaman Perslo. What is the greatest challenge our district is anticipating or working to address? The greatest challenge currently for the district? Yes. Uh, I think that's, that's a question for you rather than for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we can. We always have this, the issue of, of membership growth. I think that that's our real challenge is because we do get um, retention challenges during the year, that it's fairly common across the world to lose 40% of your members each year. We've got to replace those members. Um, mm. And I think member retention and membership growth is always a challenge. And of course, you know, the, the bringing in those new, that new fresh blood uh, that enables us to fill some of those future leadership roles as well. So I would say that that is a continual 
challenge for Toastmasters International is member retention, membership growth? Uh, for our district, just a perspective on our district, John. So I've done the, you know, that I've done the numbers of renewals, um, uh, membership payments at each month in our district, comparing that, comparing that against what TI thinks we should be achieving. Um, in the kind of the April and uh, in the April renewal, which is the second one of the year, um, about you will achieve about seven thousand out of your ten thousand. So seventy-five percent of the member payments are renewal payments. Uh, so we are retaining just on that short term basis about three quarters of our membership. So that is better than mm. the trend uh, uh, across the world where up to 40 percent do not renew. Mm. OK, well, we're getting close to our nine o'clock, Kevin. So I've not got any more questions coming in, I don't think. So mm. I don't know whether you've got any sort of final rounding up, final quote of the day that you want to mm. throw at us. So I think I'll close by saying um, my most enjoyable time on the district was my year as area, uh, area governor, okay? Um, and I suspect a number of district officers, including international leaders, have said that, okay? Because mm -hmm. you are then the bridge between the club and the bigger Toastmaster organization. So my, my most enjoyable year um, was being area governor. So if you haven't taken the plunge, uh, you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain by being area director. And if you've done that and you think, I want to go a bit higher, okay, then look at some of the benefits out there that you can gain. Um, I've not had a year where I regretted being on the district. Uh, every single year I left feeling um, stronger, feeling, um, feeling uh, that I've learned something, feeling more fulfilled than I have been. Uh, in the prior year and every year I look at the the, the year after I thinking you know except for the years uh, immediate past every other year I look at it thinking how am I going to do that how am I going to do that job um, and of course following in the footsteps of, of someone like Luan made it particularly difficult um, mm -hmm. but I think John you say the same thing you know done conference done finance and then you know district director I don't know whether you ever had the feeling of oh god imposter syndrome uh, but mm -hmm. I've definitely finished the year thinking wow how did I do that yeah, I agree. I, I I see that Toastmasters does provide a world of opportunity, and I've always been somebody that's grabbed opportunities that have been available. And I've I've had I've thoroughly enjoyed my period of time on, as one of the district leaders. I concur with you that area director has probably been the one of the most enjoyable because you get to visit other clubs, you learn so much, um, because you you can be a bit insular in your own club, but when you get out and see what other clubs are doing, you can bring some of those ideas and tips back to your own club, and of course share that with other clubs. So it's one of those most enjoyable roles. But you and John has been area director twice, three times. Yeah, I've done area director twice because we cr we created a new area in um, area six, so I did it again for when when we started that. So yes, it's. <laughs> One of those great jobs, but I've I've thoroughly enjoyed my period of time uh, in district, and I've thoroughly enjoyed every one of the jobs that I've done, and I've learned such a lot from doing them. So thank you very much, Kevin, for such a comprehensive and uh, lots of useful information. We will be sending out a copy of the recording soon, and we will notify everybody of that. Um, I just like to close by mentioning that we've got a another webinar next Sunday, which is on growing club membership where we're going to have a panel of uh, our district leaders talking about their experiences and their ideas and tips and suggestions for growing club membership. And we are planning a monthly webinar program into the new year as well. So every month there will be a webinar of some sort. If I could thank all of the attendees this evening and thank Kevin again for running that session and uh, look forward to talking to you again. Thank you, Kevin. All right. My pleasure. Thank you and good night. Good night. is this
Did that go okay, John? Or is he already shut off? He must have already shut off, yeah. 